Hi, my name is Ann Twitty, and I'm a professor here at the University of Mississippi, and we are so delighted to have Martha Jones with us uh, to speak about her new book. Welcome, Martha. Thanks very much for having me. So I've, I've really enjoyed reading your new book. Uh, it's all about birthright citizenship. Tell us a little bit about this concept of birthright citizenship and how we traditionally think of the story of how birthright citizenship comes to be a right for Americans. Well, I think one way to think about the story is that we don't think about it very much, um, which is to say um, birthright, which comes out of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, set there in 1868, um, in many ways for most Americans is something we take for granted. Um, I'm someone for whom citizenship is conferred on me at birth um, in New York City. Um, no fanfare, no ritual, no certificate. Um, and so um, to come back to the history of birthright right, is to, in many ways, um, sort of unearth an origin story that um, we really haven't um, fully incorporated into our thinking about who we are as Americans. Maybe we'll get to talk about it, but today we're in a political mm -hmm. climate where birthright is um, clearly up for debate and rethinking. Um, so the book turns out to be somewhat timely in that respect because um, unbeknownst to me, <laughs> as you know, um, as historians, we begin mm -hmm. projects uh, many, many years before books are actually published. Um, I never imagined that it would be released into a kind of political climate where it turns out we really needed to understand the origins of this principle how it came to be in the Constitution so that we can debate it in a, um, a thoughtful and an informed um, way. So I'm afraid I haven't really answered your question, <laughs> um, but, um, but it, is, um, it is an entry point for me now um, that wasn't an entry point when we began the project. Um, now it's very much about these contemporary debates as well. So what's that like as, as a historian? Because you're absolutely right, you know, usually historians start projects uh, years, if not decades, uh, before they actually come to fruition and appear in print. And obviously birthright citizenship has been in the news a lot lately. What is it like to be prepared to talk about sort of the historical work that you produced and yet sort of be uh, entering into a moment where it, it feels much more like people want you to talk about the present? Mm -hmm. um, I'll say it was a steep mm -hmm. learning curve. <laughs> um, uh, the truth is the book was, the release of the book was timed um, to coincide with the 150th mm -hmm. anniversary of the 14th Amendment. And I think we were all really pleased when um, you know, there was interest in that sort of rather <laughs> stuffy, um, but not unimportant moment in our national history. Um, so the rollout was initially very good, and it was very much about thinking about this book in conjunction with the 14th Amendment. Um, and then the political um, uh, kind of rhetoric begins to fly um, later in the summer, and um, Partly I'm vexed because so much of that rhetoric was ahistorical, uh, which is to say uh, birthright was being bandied about as if it were, you know, um, something that came about either by accident or um, without forethought. And I thought, well, wait a minute, right? We need to understand the origins for starters of this. So that is an easy place for a historian to enter. Let me tell you about the past. Let me give you some context. Um, but it's also true that um, uh, in my, uh, in a past life, not so mm -hmm. distant past, I was also a lawyer, a, mm -hmm. a litigator. Um, so I like to think on some days I know a little bit about the Constitution and its more um, contemporary workings um, and certainly I'm interested in reading in and being part of those kinds of questions. How should we think about, <clears throat> excuse me, how should we think about a, an amendment from 1868 mm -hmm. in the 21st century? Um, so, um, so I weighed in and, um, and I listen and I learn a lot. Um, I start reading folks you know, I hadn't read um, very much. Um, I'm lucky to be on, um, 
you know, to share the stage with people like Garrett Epps, who I think is sort of a wonderful historian, is a wonderful historian of the 14th mm -hmm. Amendment and its origins. Um, so I'm learning on the job, as we sometimes <laughs> do. Um, and then I'm meeting people who, for whom um, this history has a very personal um, urgency. One of my first public talks was at the new um, Civil War Museum in mm -hmm. Richmond. And it was the summer of 2018. And there was a young man, a very young man, who sat in the front row and um, did that thing that we always sort of appreciate when we give a talk, which is he sat and he nodded <laughs> right, through the whole talk. Yeah. He was very engaged and, and, um, and he was holding uh, the book, Birthright Citizens, in his hands. And afterwards he spoke to me. And what I learned is that he was a dreamer. Mm. And he was there because, of course, he was wanting to learn this history um, to inform his own life, his own thinking about his status and the status of people like him. Um, and so those experiences really, um, for me, insisted mm -hmm. that I be willing to step a bit away from the historian's distance mm -hmm and step away from providing context and begin to talk more forthrightly about mm -hmm. how I think this history should weigh in on the present. So it was very much meeting people who were being affected by our contemporary debates and recognizing that in a sense, I had always been writing for people in the 21st century. Um, I just didn't know very well how to fully or full-throatedly articulate that. Um, I hadn't been trained to do that, and I kind of had to learn it on the job. Well, I think for those of us who you know, typically write and work on dead people, which is to say everybody who works on the 19th century, um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's got to feel um, a bit jarring, but also probably exhilarating to encounter people who um, feel sort of what it is that you're writing in such a sort of immediate way and, and can actually sort of apply some of the things that you talk about in their own lives. Yeah, and um, folks might remember that um, in late October of uh, last year, um, President Trump was revealed to have, um, during an Axios interview, um, indicate that he planned to somehow undo birthright citizenship. And um, there was a flurry of media coverage, um, including um, uh, the NPR um, evening show, uh, All Things Considered. And I was on All Things Considered at the top of the first hour. And to talk about this yeah. history and the role that black Americans had played in formulating this concept and um, and through their sheer will and the struggles mm -hmm. of their lives, putting this concept sort of on the front burner for the nation. And um, I stepped away because those interviews happen like in a split second <laughs> and then it's done. Um, and I thought, well, isn't that something? Mm -hmm. The history of black Americans um, is leading mm -hmm. the national news tonight and helping to guide us through mm -hmm. a very tough moment. And I think that for me as a historian, right, is sort of that's what it is, right? <laughs> is that um, the people we write about, dead as they may be, um, live lives, right, that are um, deeply instructive about our own time. And, um, and I realized that um, what a privilege it is mm -hmm. to tell those stories and to hope that people find a way to make use of them as they will. We don't control what people right. do with our stories, but we put them out there hoping people will make good use of them. And so that was, a, that was definitely an, a, an aha moment for me about what our mm -hmm. charge can be as historians, even when we work on the remote past. So you've already intimated the, the primary sort of argument of, of, of your new book, which is that it's ordinary black people, specifically ordinary black people in antebellum Baltimore, who are really playing uh, an outsized role in shaping this concept of, of birthright citizenship and citizenship sort of more broadly. How is it that these ordinary black Americans contribute to this process? 
Well, it starts very much in um, spaces that I call African American public culture. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a story that begins in um, African American led political conventions, mm -hmm. um, newspapers, mm -hmm. um, churches, um, all the spaces where now former slaves and their descendants are convening um, in the early decades of the 19th century. Um, and they are, in my story, really reaching for um, a sort of bulwark against um, tremendous pressures on their lives um, coming from the movement we call colonization that aims to remove former slaves from the United States, coming from black laws, state laws that are uh, regulating all aspects of their everyday lives. The question is posed, right? Um, are we citizens of the United States? Mm -hmm. And if we are citizens, don't we have rights that flow from the Constitution that should um, prohibit mm -hmm. black laws that discriminate against us, um, that should prohibit colonization and the state funding of an enterprise that wants to, without cause and without process, remove us? Mm -hmm. um, and um, citizenship, I think, turns out to be, um, as you have usefully pointed out to me, um, you know, among the many um, defenses, um, military service, mm -hmm. black men have served in the military. This, they think, should protect them mm -hmm. from these kinds of assaults. Um, they have been laborers, right? They have built the nation and been engines of prosperity. This, too, um, should protect them from the um, vagaries of colonization and black laws, um, but citizenship, you know, sort of has a high, mm -hmm. a high <laughs> end sort of value, mm -hmm. and it turns out to resonate with not only black Americans but white Americans, mm -hmm. um, who it turns out themselves know too little about what citizenship is in this period. Um, now, there's a new book uh, forthcoming from Christopher Bonner mm -hmm. um, at the University of Maryland that I highly recommend because Bonner really spends his entire book in the political culture um, that is animating conventions and newspapers and really makes this full-throated um, uh, argument about the centrality of citizenship to black activists across time. Um, but as you know, the people I write about are not um, because they are in the Upper South, right. because they live in a slave state, because to organize openly and politically um, is, is sedition mm -hmm. in a state like Maryland. Um, I try to find them in other kinds of places, working on citizenship questions in the ways they have available to them. Um, and so I like to think of um, Chris Bonner's book and my book is really interesting companions, um, both thinking about the same question and um, working a slightly different kind of archive. Partners and in, in sort of telling sort of the story, maybe maybe the, the the slightly higher and the and the slightly sort of more ordinary or on the ground. Um, the setting for your book is of course Baltimore, and and you've already sort of suggested some of the differences uh, between a place like Baltimore and, for instance, um, other places that had large free black populations like Philadelphia or New York. And in many ways, your book is 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 kind of this love letter to the city of, of Baltimore. You mm -hmm. you very sort of lovingly sort of recreate antebellum Baltimore and talk about its geography and how its geography shapes the sort of communities and networks uh, that folks construct there. So why Baltimore, and what is it that makes Baltimore a great site for making the argument that you make in this book? Yeah. Um, so many folks will um, remember when I remind them; they will recall <laughs> that. Um, the critical role that the city of Baltimore plays in the life of someone like Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. right? That for Douglass, um, Baltimore is this extraordinarily uh, beautiful 
um, different and place full of possibilities, even as he's enslaved. Um, but part of what Douglas's story is how he connects mm -hmm. to this community that will grow to be 25,000 free African Americans by the eve of the Civil War and the instrumental role that the AME Zion Church, um, the woman whom he will marry, um, this community of free people um, is going to be pivotal in then um, making it possible for Douglas mm -hmm. then to um, escape and um, find his freedom and live the extraordinary life that he does. So that's an easy way to say why Baltimore. But Douglas doesn't figure, figure particularly importantly in this book, in part because he leaves. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm interested yeah. in the folks that stay. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, but the real answer to your question is, is, is slightly different, which is I begin in part because of Roger Brooke Taney, mm -hmm. um, who is the um, author of what we often refer to as the Dred Scott decision, that Supreme Court ruling, which in 1857 says that no black American, be they enslaved or free, can be a citizen of the United States. And so I come to Baltimore initially because I want to think critically about Dred Scott. I know this is something else that we <laughs> really share. Um, and I want to know, what did Tawny know mm -hmm. about free African Americans? What, why did he reach, and some would say overreach, mm -hmm. um, in a case that was about an enslaved man and his family, why did he overreach and go there to declare free people non-citizens? It's not germane to the case itself. And I thought that perhaps if I spent time in Baltimore um, and in the records of its legal culture in particular, I might win some new insight into Tawny. And I hope that I did, because um, it turns out, A, that Tawny spends nearly all his years, um, certainly the first two decades of his time as um, chief um, of the Supreme Court, still living in Baltimore, his family still in Baltimore, still a part of the political life, the cultural life of Baltimore City. It is his home. It is the place where he walks the streets. Um, and it is a place where it turns out he has um, sustained relationships <laughs> with formerly enslaved people. Um, he is a, a broker and an ally and, you know, an awkward um, benefactor mm -hmm. um, to formerly enslaved people. And now I'm beginning to be able to read Dred Scott a little differently um, and to um, see more clearly, um, I think, the ways in which what Tawny knows on the ground is in part driving what he's doing in the courthouse. And the Dred Scott, for me, turns out to be um, the end of a story rather than the beginning, the end of a story of many, many decades of strife in Baltimore and in Maryland over the status of free African Americans who think themselves to be rights-bearing people, who at least carry themselves as such in the face of others like Tawny who would um, want to see them with outrights and vulnerable always to removal through mm -hmm. colonization. So um, I come, of course, then to be um, uh, very captured by um, the lives, the politics, the everydayness of um, that community mm -hmm. um, that is Black Baltimore in this period. Um, but um, they are companion characters, I think, for me, um, to Justice Tawney and um, help us, I hope, in a new way, understand him. Oh, I think that's fascinating. I, you and I both have been interested in, in sort of this question of what Roger Tawney knows, what he must have been aware about in terms of black people's, especially legal activities. Um, he obviously was aware uh, that there were freedom suits that were filed. He's related uh, to Francis Scott Key, who's, who's, who's prosecuted a number of these freedom suits. You write about him um, signing a, a number of, of, of different uh, licenses or, or other sort of regulatory sort of uh, forms yeah. that, that free black people uh, need and e either to stay in the city or to gain access to certain rights uh, or, or privileges. And almost it, it's as if it's precisely because he knows that there has been this opportunity that he feels the need to slam the door 
on the further encroachment or the further possibility of black rights claiming. Right. And he, um, in a sense, like the activists that um, I write a bit about and Chris Bonner writes about, he calls that citizenship too, mm -hmm. right, in his own way, right, which is, as you say, to close the door on mm -hmm. that. But I think Tawny, um, for me, affirms the sense that citizenship has emerged as um, a real possibility and a real danger, and he's going to try to do what he can do um, to shut that down. Um, he's not successful. That's part of the story, um, that really um, Dred Scott, in this sense, is a failure. Um, but it is nonetheless um, part of this longer history that I was trying to tell about um, the possibility and the power of citizenship um, to combat racism in the 19th century. So you've talked about this sort of everydayness of, of rights claiming uh, in antebellum Baltimore for uh, free black people. Give me some examples of, of what that actually looks like. Right. So I'll come back to Tawny because in part because it's one of these aha moments mm -hmm. for me in the archive. Um, so among the many black laws that um, oppress free people in Baltimore is um, are those that regulate travel. Mm -hmm. Um, in particular, entry and re-entry into the state. So free black people are at liberty to leave Maryland, um, but the state imposes um, serious strictures um, on them should they desire to return. Um, they need to come into the courthouse and secure a permit. Mm -hmm. um, they can then leave and have the right to return. Should you return without a permit, you're subject to fine, you're subject to jail time, you're probably subject when you can't pay your fine mm -hmm. to sale. Um, as a slave, perhaps for the first time in your life. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and nonetheless, free people are traveling a great deal because, um, for example, in the summer seasons, they head to the mm -hmm. spas um, in Virginia where they work um, and make a living and support families. Um, they travel because they've got loved ones in mm -hmm. Philadelphia or in Norfolk. Um, they travel um, because they're itinerant preachers. And so these folks wind up in um, the local courthouse before a judge um, stating their claim to a permit. And I find um, in the archive a, a permit taken out by a man named Cornelius Thompson, um, who, um, of all things, um, secures the signatures of three respectable white persons, <laughs> um, one of whom is Roger Brooke Tawney, the second is Anne Key Tawney, mm -hmm. Tawney's wife and the sister of Francis Scott Key, and their son-in-law, J. Mason Campbell. And this, for me, with respect to Tawney, is a kind of, um, uh, how can I say, it's a kind of smoking gun, because <laughs> I realize he really does know the nitty-gritty mm -hmm. um, of what's transpiring in a local courthouse like the one in Baltimore City. and how to think then about the relative position of Tawny, mm -hmm. who I think would use one of your words, privilege. Mm -hmm. He would say, when he signed this, he was endorsing mm -hmm. the extension of a privilege to Thompson. And we don't have to work hard to find Tawny offering up that sort of characterization for that transaction. Harder, as you know, mm -hmm. is to enter um, the right. thinking of a man like Thompson um, and ask ourselves, what, was Corn what did Cornelius Thompson think he was getting? Um, and the argument I make um, is that he certainly thinks he's getting something like a right. Mm -hmm. It may be a limited right, it may be a qualified right, but Thompson believes, I'm quite sure, that this document mm -hmm. with the signatures of these distinguished white Baltimoreans, now along with the signature of a local judge, will work, mm -hmm. right, when he displays it, when he shows it, when he's confronted, probably not by kidnappers mm -hmm. who would right. care too little, um, but by others who would accuse him of traveling illicitly and look to collect some of the, mm -hmm. um, the fines right, that might be imposed on him. I think he thinks he has something that we might think of as a right. Mm -hmm. um, does Thompson thinks he thinks, think he's a citizen? 
um, that is hard, right? And you know that the archive doesn't permit us um, to wholly enter into Thompson's thinking. Um, so I've thought a lot about this, <laughs> so <laughs> indulge me. Um, but I am piecing together, um, and now I'm piecing together his life. Um, I know he's a leader in his church. Um, I know he has a family. Um, I know that he's a civic activist. Um, I know that... Um, he's savvy enough to recognize he needs to go into the courthouse mm -hmm. before he travels. Um, and now it's my voice, right, as the historian saying these are sort of the building blocks, the elements of citizenship as it is coming into being right. in this period. Um, and that... Um, I will never find people like Thompson, um, unfortunately, um, standing up and in a full-throated mm -hmm. way telling us what this means. Um, and this is where some of us sort of disagree, right, right. about how to, <laughs> how to read these materials. Right. Um, but for me, um, on the travel permits, mm -hmm. and then I'll stop, on the travel permits, um, what was deeply compelling, and these are some of the first mm -hmm. artifacts I write about, is that in this very moment, Tawney at the Supreme Court is writing about the Constitution and travel as a constitutional right, mm -hmm. the, the right to move between the states as a constitutionally guaranteed, um, not privilege, but right. right. And so, um, in part, my interpretation is sort of reflecting mm -hmm. back, right, from what Tawney is writing um, not in majority opinions yet, but in his own um, his own um, dissents, um, he's very much committed to the idea that um, citizens have the right to travel between the states. This is um, this is an essential component of petitioning the government, um, and so I'm mirroring that. I'm mir it's a mirror, right, mm -hmm. um, between if you will Thompson's implicit thinking and Tawney's explicit thinking about the meaning of travel in this moment. Um, and and that is, at least to this point, right, the best I'm able to do with sure. the sort of archives I work with. Well, I think it's, it, you know, it's, a, it's fascinating to think about a regulatory regime, which, I, you know, we typically think about regulation as a form of curtailment of rights or curtailment of privileges. Um, and yet sort of, you know, what you're suggesting is that these free black people are able to use a regulatory regime that may be meant to control them to their own purposes, uh, to achieve their own ends, to find employment outside of the state or to visit loved ones. Um, and I think that's, in the, you know, thinking about sort of how two different groups of people can agree on one scheme, this regulatory scheme of requiring permits for all kinds of different behaviors, but get something very different out of it. Yeah. Um, and you know, and I was, and I have been throughout this project, you know, deeply um, influenced by Ira Berlin's mm -hmm. work, um, "Slaves Without Masters," yes. um, uh, which is now a, a classic right. test. Um, Berlin was the first person to read um, my very <laughs> my very first attempt at this. Um, because Berlin w would say, from the sort of research he did into the statutes, right, that mm -hmm. these are um, mm -hmm. uh, unqualifiedly oppressive mm -hmm. um, uh, regulations. But what was remarkable, and a place I didn't think I would go, was into the criminal dockets mm -hmm. of Baltimore City to discover how infrequently these laws were actually enforced. Mm -hmm. And so what's going on when someone like Thompson takes the trouble to go into the courthouse and secure the permit when the likelihood that he's going to be accosted or arrested or detained is very small? And this, again, fuels my sense that in addition to whatever is going on sort of materially, that there's something symbolic mm -hmm. for someone like Thompson who does absolutely think of himself without question as a leader, um, as a member of a body mm -hmm. politic, even if it is the African-American body politic, 
um, that he's also doing something symbolic when he secures those signatures and he stands mm -hmm. in the courthouse. Um, not everyone who travels right. does that, um, but he doesn't have to, mm -hmm. it turns out, in order, in all likelihood, in order to come and go. Um, that nobody in Baltimore or in the environs is likely to stop him and prosecute right. him. But it's giving them something. I mean, I, I think this is the other part that you that you mentioned. Um, it's giving them some real tangible proof. It, 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 whatever they, they might think of, of the concept of citizenship um, or of the potentials that their freedom maybe uh, permits them or allows them, they're getting something that they can actually hold in their hands uh, that is both, uh, again, that you're thinking about those bulwarks that, that, you, that you were talking about um, at the beginning of our, of, of our conversation that is in some ways sort of a, a bulwark against um, potential threats that they might face, but is also, um, again, a piece of paper that has potentially sort of great symbolic or personal meaning to the individual who took the trouble mm -hmm. to actually go to the courthouse and, and to get these signatures, to go through the process, to jump through all those hoops. Yeah, and um, and others have written more eloquently than I certainly have about um, the, um, the deep meaning of paper. Mm -hmm. um, and um, here, um, uh, very early on, it might even be in a footnote now, um, I encountered a, a, an anecdote about a New York man named um, Thomas Jennings. And Jennings um, is a free African-American man, um, a collaborator with some of my folks in Baltimore early on around um, something called the Legal Rights Association. Mm -hmm. And um, Jennings was, um, I guess, um, dry cleaner would be a 20th century <laughs> term, but he's a, a man who does cleaning mm -hmm. of clothes. And he um, devises a process and secures a patent. And um, in this period, only citizens of the United States can secure patents. Um, and Jennings not only gets his patent, he then frames it and hangs it on the wall. Mm -hmm. And this to me, right, again, does a patent mean that he's not vulnerable to um, colonization or black laws? Does it mean that he's not disenfranchised in 1821 when New York imposes a property qualification on black voters? No. Um, but at the same time, I think we understand that when Jennings hangs that on the wall, um, it stands for a whole lot that he is... Um, striving for and struggling about, um, yes, that he is a unique uh, thinker um, and um, a, uh, you know, a, a, an inventor um, <laughs> of a new technology, but also um, that his citizenship has been recognized um, in this indirect way. And so I thought a lot about mm -hmm. the, the, the symbolism and the, um, the fragile and partial um, but also deeply important, you know, uh, Rebecca, my former colleague Rebecca Scott and Jean Ivar in their book, Freedom Papers, have written right. so um, eloquently about the meaning of these small pieces mm -hmm. of paper and the power um, that they are um, believed to, um, uh, to embody. Mm -hmm. um, I thought a lot about that when I thought about these slips mm -hmm. that are travel permits. Um, and the way we give them, mm -hmm. we can give them, or they are they are given by some people a kind of um, outsized mm -hmm. um, but real power in their lives, at least a hope for sure. power. Um, so my, probably my favorite chapter of the book is the book uh, that examines um, the efforts of Hezekiah Grice uh, mm -hmm. and a number of his compatriots. And he, I, one of the reasons I think he's such a fascinating figure is because he is such a true believer in the possibility of black citizenship yeah. uh, in the United States, but he ultimately becomes disillusioned uh, mm -hmm. and, and leaves the United States, um, self-deports to, to Haiti in, in, in pursuit of full citizenship rights that, that, that he thinks are, are being denied to him um, here. Tell me a little bit about sort of his trajectory and his and his thinking, because I think it reveals something really fascinating, again, about the particular dynamics of black politics in Baltimore, in an upper south state, in a in a in, in many ways in a more conservative area mm -hmm. than 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 we would find in, in, in Philadelphia or a New York or a Boston. Absolutely. Um, so it's um, 
it's the uh, latter part of the 1820s. Um, Grice, like many men, you know, of his circle, um, is terribly vexed by um, this combination of colonization and black laws. Um, and he becomes um, a student of the Constitution. Um, you know, it is possible still today, and it certainly is possible in the early decades of the 19th century, to pick up the Constitution, to read its plain language. Men like Grice are very um, drawn to that um, provision that requires the president be a natural born citizen. Mm -hmm. And I say, hmm. Well, if the president is a natural born mm -hmm. citizen, there must be such a category. And if there's such a category, why am I not mm -hmm. a natural born citizen? There's no color line in that provision of the Constitution. And they're on to something, right? It's, it's, it's preliminary, it's not fully formed, but they're on to something. So Grice does the extraordinary thing of um, banding with other activists in Baltimore and creating what I mentioned earlier, what they call the Legal Rights Association. And they are committed to um, their own um, education, self-education, um, but also to um, working alongside and with um, resident experts who um, will help them to mm -hmm. answer um, this question. Who are they before the law? Who are they before the Constitution? There really is no source. There really is no text. There really is no answer um, that they can discover. And I would have, I would have agree, having <laughs> myself looked for it. Um, but they're committed, right, to crafting that. So Grice bands with others to create this association. Um, and they begin to call on distinguished lawyers. Um, in Baltimore, um, John Latrobe, um, who will go on to be president of the American Colonization Society. Um, but Latrobe is a local lawyer, and for a fee, Latrobe will offer an opinion. <laughs> well, that's how lawyers work. Um, perhaps for folks um, watching, even more um, remarkable, um, they call on William Wirt, mm -hmm. um, the former Attorney General of the United States who is living in Baltimore City, um, his hometown, again, another reason right. to come and do research <laughs> in Baltimore, because there can be, we can really see these mm -hmm. close encounters. Um, they ask Wirt for an opinion. He first says, sure, that'll be, I think he said $50. They say, no problem. <laughs> and then he says, well, actually, um, for reasons I don't fully discern, and I've been through Wart's papers, I don't think we can fully know. It's too hot of a question, and Wart won't touch it. He sends them to Philadelphia, to John Sargent, um, and other distinguished lawyers with whom uh, um, Wart has collaborated um, with on the Cherokee cases. Right. And um, they are attempting to um, build, you know, allies, mm -hmm. or at least to win opinions um, on their of the question of their status, um, believing, again, I think, that if they can make this argument and make it soundly, um, that they have an instrument and a point of view that will protect them. And it is extraordinary. So you're right. Grice is disappointed, not only because he can't get these lawyers. They all right. balk. They all balk. It's remarkable to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then, even among uh, the early um, uh, folks in the black conventions, he doesn't get a, a good hearing. Right. People are not clear that this is the best route forward. Um, and he leaves to Haiti. Now, the last bit, as you know, is that um, I find Grice, who has become a distinguished um, public official, an engineer in Haiti, um, he's so highly placed that he's the agent that travels to the U.S. Um, to broker the purchase of equipment and to study, you know, various technologies that he brings back to Port-au-Prince. Um, and he's in New York during the Civil War when it seems that the tide is shifting around this question of citizenship and he walks into the customs office and takes out a passport, <laughs> a U.S. passport, and answers his own question, right? That goes all the way back to the 1820s, now in a new context, in a new scene. And to imagine 
And I don't think we have to imagine hard that Christ is still thinking mm -hmm. about this 40 plus years later, um, or 30 years later, mm -hmm. and is answering it um, in, again, this moment of about paper, mm -hmm. right? Now I've got the passport. Now I am unassailably a citizen of the United States. That to me was a stunner of a moment that he would still be thinking about that, despite all his success, mm -hmm. having raised a family um, and being very deeply entrenched in his life in um, the Haitian capital, um, he's still thinking about right. U.S. citizenship. It's remarkable. So that is my probably favorite protagonist. Mm. Do you have a, a favorite protagonist? Is there, a, is there one story in particular that you come back to kind of again and again that you um, find tremendous pleasure in sort of thinking about or, or continuing to puzzle? I, I also know that, you know, sometimes you finish a book and it goes to print yeah. and there it is in black and white, but there, there are figures mm. that you continue to think about, mm -hmm. I think probably for the rest of, of your life. Is, is there Absolutely. somebody in this book like that for you? Absolutely, um, and his name is George Hackett. Mm -hmm. Um, for folks who are going to be here this afternoon, <laughs> we're going to talk more about him um, because he was a figure, um, uh, the next generation um, from uh, Hezekiah Grice, I think, or maybe just half a generation right. from Hezekiah Grice, um, but a young man born free in Baltimore, who's the arc of whose life um, really mirrors the story I tell. He's born in 1807, just after African-American men have been disenfranchised. <laughs> in Baltimore City and, and in Maryland, and lives just to the eve of the 15th Amendment, where, if you will, the franchise is restored to black men. And Hackett's life turns out to be a, a wonderfully fascinating arc. Um, he's a local activist, he's a sailor, he's an entrepreneur. He spends an extraordinary amount of time in this local courthouse, um, but will also be someone who lobbies in the mm -hmm. state house and winds up lobbying Ulysses Grant um, in 1869 for what becomes the 15th Amendment. So Hackett has become um, an important figure for me in understanding this story and telling it. Um, so important, and I and I, and you're right to intuit maybe that um, he stuck with me so much so that I'm still <laughs> researching him and his yeah. life, um, uh, and uh, very grateful to others who have also taken an interest mm -hmm. in him and building on their work. Um, so I've been um, at the very beginning of what I hope will be um, a graphic biography oh, of Hackett. Um, because one of the last things out of this book um, for me um, has been um, the import of creating um, something for um, the young people of Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. um, my book is a rather academic right. book. It was intended <laughs> to be that, no shame in that. Um, but I worked last year with a group of um, sophomores at the Baltimore School mm -hmm. of the Arts, which is our um, city's performing arts high school, and um, they wrote vignettes, some of which came out of Birthright Citizen, including um, an important one about um, Hackett. Mm -hmm. And it was a play on, um, not a play, but it was an interpretation that built out of Hackett's will which he writes in 68 or 69, just before he passes. Um, and it's a beautiful um, tribute to um, his um, young stepdaughter, Henrietta, and he takes great care um, to provide for her and to cross all the T's and dot mm -hmm. all the I's so that his will is unassailable um, and she is provided for. And the students began with that and created a, a dialogue between Henrietta and George. She goes on herself to be a political activist in her own life. Um, so I've learned a lot more about him, um, a lot more than could make it into this book. Um, and I hope for the opportunity to um, use his story, um, his life story um, as a way of illustrating for um, younger readers, but for older readers too, um, I, I, guess, I suppose, um, uh, the centrality of the kinds of questions that um, 
the book raises mm -hmm. um, in the life of someone like um, Hackett. So, um, yeah, he's 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 right here, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, good for him. He's not going to leave me alone until I'm done, and I'm grateful for that. Actually, it's been a great um, impetus to. It's sort of where we started, mm -hmm. you know, which right. is sort of who are you writing for, mm -hmm. who are you speaking to, what do we need to do as historians um, with our work, with our research, with our insights in order to um, uh, reach the kinds of audiences mm -hmm. that we want to reach. And um, I've come to learn how important it is to me to mm -hmm. um, be sure that I'm not um, overlooking young people um, for whom it turns out encountering this history, studying it is meaningful. The young man who portrayed Hackett in the production that our students did at the Walters Museum last spring in Baltimore um, during a rehearsal, he said to me, why do they keep this history from us? Mm. And I thought, oh, so there's mm -hmm. a challenge, right? Which is to say, um, why, why don't we right. bring this history to young people? Um, so that's what I'm working on these days. Well, I can't think of a, a better way to kind of wrap up sort of our conversation. You've given us sort of a, a preview of, of what you're going to be working on next. And I think, you know, this kind of amazing call to um, historians to, to try to find ways to sort of connect with real flesh and blood people, not not people who just live in, in, in documents, but 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 people um, in the 21st century whom, mm -hmm. whom, whom our work um, can can affect and, and shape and in these really profound ways. Thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to your talk tonight. Yeah, thanks so much. I really appreciate it.